Hi, welcome to Offscript. I'm Zach Lewis. And I'm Dr. Draper. Today on the show, we're taking a look at the Super Mario Brothers movie. We're looking at Renfield, starring Nicholas Holt and Nicholas Cage. We're doing a micro-review of Suzume, uh, a super-sized super show for, for the Super Mario Brothers review. Three reviews, technically two and a half. We Look, we tried to do three reviews in the past, okay? Three reviews does not work for this format. We can't stay on track. We'll keep it tight. Suzume will be fast, but it's worth talking about. We also got to talk about HBO. Uh, they're doing a rebrand, or at least their online division is. If you haven't heard, we got hot takes about it in the middle of the show. And before we get to all that, we need to get to the news. And the first thing in the news this week, uh, Star Wars Celebration happened. Woo! Andy and I acclaimed Star Wars for new Yay. listeners to Sean being we're not we're not big Star Wars fans here. Uh, yeah, but this thing happened. Lots of announcements. Uh, the House of Mouse is putting out more content branded Star Wars, and Andy's got all the hot deets to share with us and tell us what's going on in the galaxy far, far away. Andy, what's happening? So the big news on the movie front is that there were three movie projects announced. Um, somehow, Ray returned. Um, <laughs> after a lot of controversy with The Rise of Skywalker and Daisy Riz Ridley Ridley's character, Ray, uh, they w are planning to do a movie set 15 years after the events of Rise of Skywalker, bringing back Daisy Ridley as an older Jedi master. Somehow she has that rank. Um, and they're going to go from there, and they're going to continue this Star Wars Palpatine storyline into another movie. Um, they were careful not to. They didn't announce like a trilogy or a set of films. They, it's just one, and we'll see how it goes. Uh, they also announced... Uh, some film that will take place between, uh, I guess, episodes three and four and wrap up the uh, or set six and seven uh, that will wrap up the uh, multiple storylines of the Mandalorian verse, um, which in, in, involves a couple of more seasons of TV. We'll see how that goes. And then James Mangold, fresh off Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, is going to be doing a Star Wars film that's going to be way in the past about the very first Jedi Ever. So those were the three big projects uh, that were announced so far. I should clarify that when I say at the, at the show open that Andy and I are not Star Wars fans, we're like old beleaguered Star Wars fans, right? Like franchise fatigue Star Wars fans. When we started this show, we were definitely watching all of the Star Wars movies that were coming out. But that was like five years ago. It's been half a decade. And boy, Disney has just been stepping on the gas as hard as they can with this stuff. They got Disney Plus shows on Disney Plus shows, The Mandalorian, Ahsoka, Boba Fett season 2.5. I can't even keep up anymore. Right. And like, I do feel like an old man shouting at clouds a little because I feel like I'm getting left behind by this franchise that is clearly catering to a younger audience. But at the same time, they're still making another Skywalker movie. They still need the olds. All right. They need us in theaters to bring them back. And they got to do something because they cannot figure out a way to craft a Star Wars movie. To go in a theater like the last good one was what episode nine and that wasn't even that good like that one clearly had a slip in quality and they saw it at the ticket sales like so it's obvious they need a direction james mangold is strong right he's coming off indiana jones on the lucasfilm feature uh and i'm sure you know just like john favreau they're reeling him in they want him in that talent pool baby he's, he's got some talent great Let's grab them and burn them out, right? That's that's the strategy. And meanwhile, like I guess that's awesome. They're doing a new Ray movie. But the thing I'm most jaded about is this like up in the air, tying up a bunch of Disney Plus series with D Dave Filoni. I, I know a bit about the man. Filoni was like George Lucas's like protege. He was his apprentice. He was going to be the guy like to take Star Wars where it's going. And he built Clone Wars, which had like seven seasons on TV. Lots of TV in Star Wars has come from Dave Filoni. So he's a great fit for it. But like, God, I, who's going to care? Andy, who's going to go watch a movie in a theater with, featuring like five different storylines from Disney Plus shows? Right. Like you said, it's homework, the movie. Uh, you have to have seen five seasons of television also, the Clone Wars, even to know what's happening in the TV shows now, you have to have watched eight seasons of the Clone Wars, which is a series from the 2000s and 20, 20 teens. And that's that's just not ideal. And I I honestly think that that movie is going to fall apart because it's also dependent on like three more shows that are coming up, like another season of The Mandalorian, uh, two seasons of, of Ahsoka. We'll see what else there. And it's just like you're weaving plot lines through multiple series. 
and hoping to tie it all up in a movie. And it, it just seems like a recipe for disaster. And I've totally checked out of the Mandalorian at this point. I watched the first episode of season three and I was like, Nope, I'm done. Give I'm not even sure I finished. I'm not even sure I finished season two. Of the Man- I think I finished season two. Yeah. I finished season two of the Mandalorian because I remember the big reveal at the end. But uh, yeah, I, I think there's some serious like fatigue here with these properties. Listen, this is not the first time Disney has announced something about Star Wars that has not come true. We could very easily see this Filoni feature go straight to Disney Plus, where the audience for it is already baked in, right? That would make the most sense instead of trying to elevate it into theaters where a lot of people won't be familiar. Um, these, these movies may not happen at all. Like, we're sitting on a bevy of announced Star Wars films that have not come to pass, right? Patty Jenkins, director of Wonder Woman, is supposed to make one of these uh damon lindelof and db vice the creators of hbo's game of thrones are supposed to make one taika watiti is supposed to make a star wars movie like all of these things have been announced and then just not happened so i guess some like this seems like a fine plan forward but it's not as bombastic as i think maybe they were trying to make it out to be at star wars celebration 2023 right i i, I don't know any other thoughts on this one andy i i think uh i think we'll see the ray movie that seems kind of most likely to happen i think that one's the farthest along although a number of writers have joined and left that project the other two are are up up in the air because so much of it just depends like disney is so knee-jerk and they're they're so scared of the audience reaction to to decisions that they just they change at the drop of a hat yeah well, I hope, you know, everybody gets their respective bag. Like, good for Daisy Ridley, I guess, uh, back at it. You know, I, there were some people that were in those movies that, like, felt pretty burned by the experience of starring in those Star Wars features. Like, and I'm glad that she's obviously, like, doing her thing. She she did a great job. I just, I guess I wish she had gotten more work after. I, everybody in, like, the Star Wars yeah. follow-up should have, you know, John Boyega. Anyway, uh, we should move on to our next story. Uh, the Super Mario Mo- Brothers movie is getting ready to join the $1 billion box office club we've been saying it for months on, on off script all right we've, we've been talking big game about the super mario brothers movie now that we've seen it we've got hot takes to get to in a minute but andy how is this happening how is the whole world turning out to see a video game film our video game adaptations finally here have they arrived so the mario brothers movie made a ton of money in its five kind of five day release it released over the easter weekend and it, it made i think 200 million dollars domestic over 300 million dollars global broke a bunch of, of records highest grossing animated film ever highest grossing uh film of the year so far um and its second weekend it, it dropped merely like 37 percent um and another 90 million in its second weekend which is i mean that's just showing incredible legs uh, on this movie and it's 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 over 700 million after a week and a half almost two weeks and yeah give it another month and it's going to be in the billion dollar club which is is crazy and it marks kind of the most successful video game movie ever so far and we're probably going to be getting a whole lot more of these <laughs> yeah yeah that's for sure uh the super mario brothers movie comes from two very important studios that are worth mentioning here number one nintendo right storied video game company moms have been calling video games nintendos for years like that's the way it's <laughs> always been nintendo is a staple and of course they have super mario who everybody knows right like people were playing super mario 30 years ago in college like everybody knows super mario man jumps he flies he throws fireballs you know him you love him it's got bowser peach all the classic characters and most importantly i think it comes from illumination entertainment who if you don't know is a studio behind despicable me the minions movies the despicable me sequels the grinch i think they did a couple of those uh, cat in the hat adaptations actually uh secret life of pets the sing movies like both of those got sequels like very popular animated features aimed at very young audiences you slam these two titans together and you get the super mario brothers movie a movie that's basically guaranteed to just print money uh it would be foolish for nintendo not to make more of these right like i'm already thinking they got a zelda movie on the way they're working out their kirby chops gotta get kirby out there like the super mario brothers 2 movie um i i I, you can go anywhere from here i mean this is gonna launch a a massive franchise for nintendo they have tons of storied properties that people generations are familiar with in the games like you said zelda or in just within the Mario verse, that's the other that you got Donkey Kong characters, you could do spinoffs, you got Princess Peach, other <laughs> other princesses, Daisy, Rosaline, like <laughs> like 
there's so much you could do bowser backstory the bowser trilogy um there's so much to be mined here and it, it's gonna be it's gonna be huge like and they might do you know hopefully they don't do, they don't do what lego did which was they kind of um oversaturated us because they did lego movie lego movie 2 batman lego the ninjago movie and then it started to really lose steam but um i mean this could be a massive franchise for years to come it's funny looking at like this movie and a list of other high grossing films uh hollywood reporter has it here like uh the top 10 biggest second weekends of the north american box office um super mario brothers movie is like what six in this list and every other one in there is a sequel or a legacy property every film like or it's a remake 2017's beauty and the beast like that's a live action adaptation top gun maverick is a sequel frozen 2 and then the super mario brothers movie is literally first one boom out there it's not even really it, it, it's not let me let me be clear it's not a remake of the bob hoskins <laughs> john leguizamo super mario brothers movie this does not count this is its own beast all right and like uniquely it is just boom staple to the floor right there at number six like this movie is making an absurd amount of money i can't believe it um it's a weird day for video game adaptations right like there was a time when this was really hard to do but now thanks to the inclusion of things like animation and a bit of smarter creative budgeting we're getting really incredible things like the last of us on hbo or the sonic movies which have done really well De detective pikachu did really good and like it seems like the video game adaptation is here to stay. A lot of gamers out there may think, well, hold on, I play Call of Duty. I play NBA. These aren't the kind of things I want to see, but like, it's not about you. All right, it's about the kids whose parents got to buy them kids. tickets and popcorn and kid packs, right? A little popcorn drink. That's what this is about, all right? Like, and Nintendo is making yeah. bank, and so is Illumination. Yeah, I I, I went to see uh, other, other thing, things when I saw Suzume over, over the weekend. There were tons of people there for Mario, and I mean... Parents, parents were just spending so much concessions. Like I saw people ringing up over a hundred dollars in concessions sure. for for the kids. It was it was nuts. I had to wait. Uh, I went and saw John Wick uh, a couple of weeks ago when this first had come out, and I had to wait in line for almost a half hour for to get concessions because there were so many people there for the Mario movie. It was just insane. Yeah. I, I, I don't see this thing slowing down anytime soon. I think it's out worldwide, but I read somewhere it actually isn't. So I got a premiere in a few more countries. So like, mm -hmm. I, I don't know. I think it's going to continue crushing. It's headed for a Billy, baby. It's the way it's going to be. Super Mario Brothers movie. Disney, get out of the way. <laughs> Super Mario <laughs> Billion. Illumination. It's, it's sure. So Illumination's making big features. Bill Illumination. Uh, and with that, we need to talk about like the actual review. Of course, we have seen the Super Mario Brothers movie. I'm excited to talk about it. Big video game fans, Andy and I, all right, at least in our heyday. And uh, now that we've seen this feature, I'm excited to get into it. Of course, I'm taking the summary on it, so please excuse my clumsy delivery. The movie is the Super Mario Brothers movie. So Super Mario Brothers movie, of course, is the story of Mario, an Italian plumber, an affable, lovable, short, cute little guy with a mustache and a red cap and overalls who lives in the Bronx <laughs> or Brooklyn, I think. Some kind of New York associated place uh, with his brother Luigi, where they've set up their small plumbing business. And right after they get started uh, trying, trying to make their way as a small business, uh, one of them unknowingly tumbles into a pipe deep under the city which transports them through a magical land called the Mushroom Kingdom. And of course, there they meet Princess Peach and Toadstool and Bowser and all of the characters that you know and love from the Mario video games. Uh, this collaboration between Nintendo and Illumination was very thorough. They've taken a lot of time to put this feature together. And believe it or not, it comes out to a 90-minute romp. You'd think such a big grand thing would take a really long time, but it's really fast. The film stars Chris Pratt as Mario, a Charlie Day as Luigi, Jack Black as Bowser, Anya Taylor-Joy as Princess Peach, and a bevy of other fantastic voice actors the movie is the super mario brothers movie andy what'd you think so i think there's things that work well about this and then some things that don't number one it's important to keep in mind uh who this is for this is very much a kids movie and like a young aimed at young audiences like probably between the five and ten crowd um so that being said that it doesn't really work narratively it's kind of all over the place with it with the plot and the pacing and it moves kind of too fast 
but like a, a five year old's not not gonna care about this. Where it does succeed is in the visuals. Like the the Mushroom Kingdom lo looks amazing. A lot of the the recreation of, of video gameplay is really good. There there's fantastic racing scene on Rain. Road, which I, I thought was really fantastic. Uh, the visuals are are really stunning, and the plot's just kind of whatever enough to get you from sequence to sequence. But it's it's a lot of fun. It's it's a quick ninety minutes. Uh, put it on; the kids will watch it a hundred times a day. So it's like I just thought it was okay, but I'm not the target audience. That being said, we do we do get we can have really good kids movies. Look at the Lego Movie, the Batman <laughs> Lego Movie, um, Pixar. Uh, this isn't quite there, but it's it's obviously very successful, um, and it's still it's still a fun time. It's funny. Um, we were just talking about before the show. Uh, the second feature we're reviewing this week is Renfield, and that's actually directed by Chris McKay, who directed the Lego Batman movie. And that was a movie like that was obviously adapted from a larger property, but was a bit smart. Like there's some fast references, especially in regards to Batman. It's surprisingly deep. Like on some of the like deep cuts <laughs> in the Lego Batman movie, man, lots of old villains, old Robin costumes, cheesy jokes about the relationship, like a lot of stuff that like, you know, a five year old is not going to get. And the Super Mario Brothers movie is not aimed at the people who watch the Lego Batman movie. And he's absolutely right. He actually said it best uh, when he first saw the feature before me and, and he texted me about it and I said, hey, what do you think? Soft, soft review. And he said, there's movies for kids and there's movies for babies. And the Super Mario Bros. movie is for babies. And it's true. <laughs> like, this is for babies. And this is the thing that I think Illumination brings to the table. This is something I didn't understand until I was sitting in the movie uh, watching the trailers in front of it. And they had a trailer uh, for a bunch of Illumination's features leading up to uh, their December movie. It's coming out this Christmas. It's called... Migration. I don't know. It's something about Migration, yes. It's about a family of ducks that are migrating. Uh, and, and in that trailer, it's just like 90 seconds of everything Illumination's done from the studio that brought you Despicable Me and Despicable Me 2 and 3 and Minions and Minions 2 and The Grinch and Secret Life of Pets and Sing comes and the Super Mario Brothers movie comes migration. That's fine. And, and watching that, like, I realized that the thread here, one, stellar animation, two, fine voice actors, three, all these movies are aimed at very young kids, very young kids, like all of them. All of them are aimed at babies, and like this is what they do well. So when I go see the Super Mario Brothers movie, all the Nintendo trappings I love. I'm actually, I, I played a lot of the Super Mario Brothers games, believe it or not, probably more than I should have. But all of that like jumps out to me as good stuff. The stuff that's weak is, is fundamentally in the script, which is just like light speed fast. Oh my God, you do not have any character development. We are moving and shaking through things <laughs> because it's a movie for kids. That's what it's supposed to be. Yeah, ex exactly. And that's what, again, when, when you're thinking about this movie, think of Minions and Minions is for young, young kids and bad memes <laughs> and that's what this yeah. uh but it's, it succeeds I, and i mean every kid every family went to see this over easter i think and and this weekend and it's it's really successful in that space and it is important to have movies for that uh demographic uh let's talk a little bit about characters because because we have a, a great cast uh zach tell us about it yeah, uh, so like I said at the top, we've got Mario, our lead, played by Chris Pratt, uh, his brother Luigi, played by Charlie Day, two down-on-their-luck plumbers, right? And like in the open of the film, they are completely normal people, right? That's, that's actually something uh, Mario creator Shigeru Miyamoto has said for years. Mario is supposed to be a normal dude. He's supposed to be a normal person in an abnormal place, which is what this movie does great. The two of them go to the Mushroom Kingdom, where they meet Toad, played, played by uh, Keegan-Michael Key, uh, who takes them to see Princess Peach, played by Anya Taylor-Joy, on the way. They, they stumble into Bowser, played by Jack Black. Things are not quite that order. There's a little bit of mystery to it, but it's fine. Um, and before we know it, we're on our way. We meet Donkey Kong, played by Seth Rogen. Like a, a, a cast of likable uh, ac American actors. Say for Anya Taylor-Joy, I think she's British. But uh, otherwise, like everybody here is pretty interesting, believe it or not. Like all of these characters have some kind of deeper aspect to them that makes them fascinating. Luigi is a coward, like quaking in his boots, scared of everything. And Anya Taylor-Joy isn't sure where she comes from, right? She's a, she's a princess who's been given this responsibility of ruling the Magic Kingdom, but ultimately, like, is unsure of herself. Bowser uh, is infatuated with Princess Peach, which nobody understands, uh, leads to a little ditty in there where Jack Black sings a bunch, um, 
Heard that song made the Billboard Top 100 today. That's insane. Uh, believe it or yeah. not, the most <laughs> uninteresting of all of these characters is Chris Pratt's Mario. Like, Mario is, unfortunately, to a fault, a completely normal person. And, like, that doesn't make him very interesting on screen, whereas everybody else has something about them. There is a, a bit of a something in there about his his willingness to try, try, try again and, like, to, to not give up. And I guess that kind of ties into, like, the larger Mario theme of like having multiple lives and dying and restarting a level, but it's, it's too half baked to like really come through. And, and out of all of them, I think Pratt still has the weakest, weakest performance. Like that's what everybody predicted when this was announced. Everybody's like, Chris Pratt is Mario. Yuck. You know, everybody else fits. He's just fine. And I think he got it because of his work in the Lego movie. Yeah. Uh, he's, it's just super bland. It's so middle of the road. There's just not a lot of personality. Uh, yeah, everyone else is more fun. Like Charlie Day is as Luigi's great, doesn't get enough screen time. Uh, Anya Taylor Joy, who's actually she's from Argentina. She's like she fe- speaks fluent Spanish. If you've ever ever heard, of. Uh, she, uh, she's Argentinian. Yes, I guess else. I knew that. Yeah, uh, uh, but she, oh. she plays Princess Peach and kind of uh, I'm gonna say overpowered. I could tell they wanted to steer away. They wanted to make her like a strong female, which is great. But then they, they Luigi turns into the damsel in distress instead because he's the one who gets captured by Bowser and has to be uh, kind of uh, rescued. Jack Black is uh, giving it 110 percent. Like he's so good as as Bowser. His song has gone viral, um, really putting in a, a good performance. Uh, like you said, Pratt is just weak. And I don't I don't know like, if it's the yeah. character or it's Pratt or just kind of both but um yeah Mario's just not not really interesting uh the kongs we, we meet donkey kong and cranky kong and the kong family uh donkey kong played by um seth rogan who refused to do any kind of like he's like i'm not doing a voice i'm just like you're getting seth rogan if you if you hire me <laughs> and that's it that's exactly what you get you get his <laughs> kind of laugh um, um so it's fine but it's, but funny, it's, a, good, it's a it's a good cast and it Go mostly works it's funny before the movie started uh you see a bunch of trailers for upcoming things of course and one of them was the new teenage mutant ninja turtles movie i think we talked about that in the trailer park a couple weeks ago if not we'll get to it uh, as, yeah. as more comes out about it but that's produced by seth rogan it opens with like a title slate that says like from eternal teenager seth rogan and like the more i learn about the man and the more i see him and things like yeah he's kind of just like i'm literally just gonna do my thing if you hire me you're just getting what i'm doing and that's it and like i i respect that all the all the good actors do right that's what jack black's doing in this like yeah he's he's playing bowser but like they tweak his voice a bit like he's just going big bold brash jack black charlie day is being like meek mild charlie day like those are the things that work well like that's that's what i think works best i think the reason chris pratt and i need to move off him but just one one more thought i think the reason like he's had a lot of success in voice acting is because the characters he's played have been like phenomenally endearing like Emmett in the lego movie is like so inspired and hopeful all the time it's gonna be a great day guys and like he does that really well he did that on parks and rec when he played andy but mario doesn't have that <laughs> like he's not really this like up and at him kind of character like he's kind of just a dude and like I, it's a shame they don't do more with him i'm sure they'll do more in the sequel there's gonna be more here but let's talk about the mushroom kingdom all right we gotta talk about our setting uh new york is fine right we do actually get a good look at like the mario family including the father who i think is actually voiced by in like two lines charles martinet who's the original voice of mario believe it or not he's got a little cameo in here but once you get to the mushroom kingdom that's where everything's exciting and not only is it big and bright and bold and we get this like very quick but are admittedly uh full uh trek across like these various worlds that you would see in the games like you see all the all the characters all the little all the little takes that like make the mushroom kingdom what it is and like these are the things that i think is going to sell merchandise for this movie it's what it's really all about like there are so many cute little monsters in this world like you got the toads and the booze and the koopas and the bomb the, the bob bombs and the penguins and like the dude there's so many little things they Bullet can sell bill. little stuffed animals for yeah everything everything in the mario world like has eyes and like has thoughts but it's not like creepy they're like big and cutesy and thoughtful and 
this is able to work because Nintendo has been like, you know, shaping this for 35 years in video or longer, even in video games. Like they've got Mario pretty much down to a science and what people like and don't like. So it's like, it slides really easily into illuminations animation and makes for like a really full setting. There's a couple of great sequences in like Donkey Kong land. There's a, there's a Mario Kart sequence. that's really great. Like that stuff I think works well. Yeah, uh, again, the, the setting is, is probably one of the, the better parts of it. We see have this, these different worlds. We have the Mushroom Kingdom. We have Bowser's Castle. Uh, uh, we briefly visit, like, the the Ice Kingdom. And it's just, it's eye-popping, and it, it's fun. And that's part of, again, the, the setting. To just It's a fun place to be. Tons of colors. They're going to sell so much merchandise. Um, and if people don't know, the, the merchandise is really where money is can be made for a film franchise. That's why Star Wars has been kind of been geared younger and younger in the last decade or so because that you can make three times as much off the merchandise as you can uh from the movie i did also want to mention one of the things that really charmed me is uh the use of like tying in elements of playing the game into the world of the mushroom kingdom yeah. uh when peach and mario first kind of set out to go save luigi uh peach says well hold on i want to test you first and she like hits a question block <laughs> and, like this giant item course comes out that mario has to like run it looks like an obstacle course to prove that he's like worthy to participate whatever and it looks just like a mario level and it's got like all the traps and the falling blocks and the bullet bills and all the, the piranha plants all the things it's supposed to have in there and she explains before he runs it hey eat a mushroom and you'll grow big and strong like, like popeye right like you get you get a power up but if you get hit you shrink back down and like if you if you eat a fire flower you'll you'll get the ability to throw fireballs and if you grab a star you'll get the all that like helps flesh out the world i think for kids and makes it feel like so much more tangible because not only is this like a real functioning place there's like an there's a there's an economy of like power and items in it <laughs> that you can participate in and like i think that's neat like i i think that's great for a kids flick like it really threads a needle of making something that feels like full and whole but also being 90 minutes like just visually appealing very quick very charming you got a, a fun song from Bowser in there. Boom. Credits, right? Like you can't go wrong. Yeah. The runtime, I think really helps it because despite it's kind of narrative issues and where it's just, it's a little all over the place. It goes by. So, so fast. It just works. If this were two hours or anything close to that, I would be like dying probably halfway, but it, it's, Oh, it's over and done with quick enough. Like I said, it's going to be a great night to move it movie for the kids are going to wear out if they could wear out the the vcr player or the dvd player that's what uh you would do it's true uh only other thing i wanted to mention before we get to final thoughts is uh the music uh I had an entire medley of all kinds of tracks from across the mario franchise composer koji kondo has been paid great tribute uh he didn't actually compose the soundtrack to this but I forget the name of the guy who did. He pulled like all of that old stuff and like mixed it together and came up with new variations. And like, there's so much Mario music in this movie. Like you, you can't even get to it all. Some of it like just flies by. It's in one quick scene and then you're on to another track. Um, that stuff worked great. Like I, I think pulling from Nintendo's like rich IP, like as much as possible really is going to make something that feels bigger and bolder. And I think that's a big part of the reason the Super Mario Brothers movie stands apart. Uh, at least a name anyway and selling tickets oh my god families are going to see this thing couldn't have picked a better weekend easter weekend great time any other thoughts andy for uh recommendations no i think i'm ready andy would you recommend the super mario brothers movie yeah i would i would uh for most people for fans of the genre if, if you grew up playing uh video games i know i had an original nes and played the original Mar mario brothers uh there's a lot to appreciate um it's great for kids it's great for the family uh, it doesn't really it has a lot of narrative issues plot things but that's something a stickler is going to be more about it, most of people are going to enjoy it it's fantastic visually there's good pro performances from everyone except chris pratt <laughs> and uh fun for the whole whole family keep in mind it is a kid's film it's for kids young kids but so yeah i'm <laughs> I same. I, I'd say this is a great time if you want something real light. Like you, you, this is good for an adult. This is a good like throw it on while you're doing laundry movie. Like because it moves real fast and before you know it, ninety minutes is done. Like it's great, keeps your attention. Fine. 
Uh, if you got kids, oh, dude, like they're going to love the Super Mario Brothers movie. It's great. Like this will be the kind of thing they're like, please, please buy me the Blu-ray and I'm going to run it 10 times, right? Like whatever. I don't know what service gets Illuminations movies, maybe Peacock. I'm not even sure, but like they're going to, they're going to, they're going to sell subs on the back of this. Um, if you are a video game fan and you're a lonely gamer <laughs> <laughs> doesn't have a lot going on and is excited to see the new super mario brothers feature you're going to be disappointed because it is not for you like all the video game trappings are great but like it is so not aimed at you at all like they are aiming for children and 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 for what it's worth they hit the target all, almost perfect with that we should probably move into our next segment andy you want to introduce this for us it's time for the death of cinema so we're going to be talking about some big news that came out last week. HBO Max to be renamed Max with the addition of Discovery Plus content. Uh, launch date pricing finally c coming through. So this was a huge piece of news that came came last week. HBO Max will just be Max. Uh, there are some weird uh, marketing reasons for, for that. They, they think that the HBO brand kind of de deters certain demographics, and so they want to cast as wide a net as possible by using this very generic name. Uh, the price is going to go up a dollar, and it will, uh, but it will be kind of, there will be an HBO tab and like a Discovery tab, um, and this is launching mid-May, so this is huge news, a lot of backlash on the name. Zach, what do you think? Andy and I, uh, keen listeners of the show, will know that Andy and I have been talking about this for a while. Like uh, when when Warner Brothers kind of got scooped up by Discovery, David Zaslav uh, s stepped in as CEO. Some people shuffled around, and, and ultimately, this is where they're at. Like they've been building to this for a while, merging Discovery Plus with HBO. And, and I personally have expressed disinterest in this because these two audiences to me like just could not be further apart. Like they really couldn't. I understand like, no, I don't know. I don't understand. I'm not, I'm not going to defend it. One is basic cable and one is premium cable. Like one is toddlers and tiaras and the other is, is game of Thrones. Like these are two totally, totally, <laughs> totally different groups of people. And this extends to streaming services. HBO Max is a $14.99 streaming service. All right. It is premium quality. And their Sunday night slate through all of 2023 has been exceptional. My God, are they putting out Street Fire, The Last of Us, Succession, <laughs> Barry, The White Lotus. Like they can't go wrong. House of Dragon. They can't go wrong. Like, and they're only doing more. Meanwhile, Discovery Plus is not a premium short service. It's $5.99, all right? It is bottom of the barrel. It costs a dollar more than Apple TV, and it's not nearly as good. If you like reality television, you'll love it. But if you like reality television, you're probably not listening to this podcast because those two audiences don't mix. One is somebody who gets home, turns on the TV, and just lets it roll. The other is a person who seeks out content, right? Who seeks to find something that fits their niche better. And it's weird that the two of these are going together, all right? And I, I get that they want to bring them into something, but it, it like for those of us that love HBO, it just feels like discovery plus is hitching its wagon on like oh hey i'm gonna grab this tiger by the tail and we don't like god forbid it slows down anything on their end and it's frustrating but in part not number one just because they're losing the name and i'll also talk about quickly like a couple of other things that have changed since but like i, I think just changing from hbo max to max is is dumb and i don't, <laughs> don't like it what do well, you think what's Andy? a What's hilarious is that the tagline, it's the tagline is Max, the place to go to for HBO. <laughs> and so, like, yeah. you've had to come up with this weird way to still include the HBO brand because that is so recognizable. Um, it's just, um, we, we are going to get three tiers of, of pricing. There's going to be Max Ad Light, which is going to be $10 a month, um, where you can watch in glorious 1080p. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, kind of the kind of the middle of the road tier uh, max ad free is gonna be sixteen ninety nine a month, um, which is oh actually that one's also ten a ten eighty p. But what are you gonna do? And then they have max ultimate ad free, which is gonna be uh, twenty dollars a month, and, and uh, that'll give you four k uh, re resolution and more. Uh, Zach, what do you think about these pricing tiers? 
For what it's worth, I, I, I don't like any of these tiers, and I've got particular reasons why, but Andy was the first to point out that Max Ad Free, which is functionally the thing most people on HBO Max are on now, is only going up a dollar for the inclusion of the entire Discovery Plus library. That's not that bad. I do think these prices will change quickly. I, I give it, what, six months, a year, eight months? And they'll be like, hey, we're going to up at a dollar or two, right? Like, this is a, this is a soft entry kind of thing. Uh, and the inclusion of these tiers is fine, I guess. I, I tell you, I don't know who is getting the Max Ultimate ad free. Other than, like... <sighs> older big audiences. household maybe uh, i don't yeah i don't i don't want to say boomers but older audiences who maybe don't know any better right and they're just like yeah give me the give me the, the tall one whatever the big one right give me the premium one i'll take that um i dude it, it is almost for certain like you cannot effectively stream 4k ultra hd with compression yeah like you just can't like it is it, it doesn't really happen so that's kind of just marketing shtick the four concurrent streams is great for families i guess i think it's lame the other two are limited to two but whatever um and the offline downloads, I think, is good if you travel a lot, right? Like you would want to take that. And if you're going overseas or somewhere where you may not be able to get access to HBO easily without a VPN, like, yeah, you, you do that. For the rest of us, we'll probably be on Max Ad Free. For Max Ad Lite, hey, man, there's, there's people that subscribe to those on every service. I don't, but like, there's definitely people that do. So I guess that's not bad. I mean, if anything, I'm, I'd like that will open the door to people to for people to watch things like the last of us and house of dragon that they might have otherwise been, I don't know, pirating, borrowing from friends, like lifting from other, you know, HBO sources. I, I don't know. Yeah, th this is, um, and it's going to be a shift. We'll see how, you know, consumers react to, to this once the plan rolls out, which is like I said, the middle of, uh, middle of May, um, which is just around, just, around the corner um it's probably gonna be a little bumpy and i'm not looking forward to having a bunch of discovery trash on my on my H beloved hbo app yeah um there is a great line in here from uh who is this uh jb jb perrett present ceo of global streaming games for warner brothers discovery regarding losing hbo from the title uh and i think it's a it's a clumsy answer, but here's what he says. He says, we all love HBO. It's a brand that's been built over five decades. Uh, it's a stand for edgy, groundbreaking entertainment for adults. But it's not exactly where parents would most eagerly drop off their kids. And yet, Warner Brothers Discovery has some of the best-known kids characters, animation, and brands in the industry. Uh, not surprisingly, animation has not done met its true potential on HBO Max. And, like, who, who cares? Like... <laughs> Like, hey, animation does fine on HBO, but, like, you guys didn't get to be HBO by making kids shows. Like, who yeah. is pushing that? Like, I, I love their animation. They're great. But, like, I Sunday it's, Night Slate, I'm not tuning in for animation. Like, it's, it's not important. Yeah, and I think they dump, actually dumped a bunch of their kind of kid programming um, or, like, Sesame Street and a bunch of other cartoon stuff because that's, that's not the HBO brand. You know, that's what Disney is. Um, but it looks like they're going to maybe try and push that maybe on discovery plus uh i'm not sure like i said we don't actually have the have the data so because it, it seems like again they're worried about uh hbo brand dissuading potential users and um so i guess you know if that's really the the truth then you know they're they're trying to get that dis more of that discovery plus crowd yeah hey, they've got some other internal musings about like just how simple and short and effective a title like max is right it's got it all there you don't have to think about it and then they said well when we were developing it in-house we wouldn't say oh yeah that program's going to be on hbo discovery plus we just say it's on max it's easy it's short it's tight it's easy to say and like i i, I totally get that man but like y'all weren't in american households when people were saying like hbo go or hbo plus or like H hbo.com like that was a whole clumsy thing that was that confusing you very yeah. poorly very poorly navigated and you know what people just said it's on hbo because that's ultimately like the brand where people are aligned so i like for what it's worth max will do fine i in fact it'll probably do better than fine like i bet they're gonna have awesome conversion great signups they're gonna be bringing the discovery plus library and hbo library together those audiences are gonna collide in some fashion i man i think if they have a good home page and it's easy to navigate because it's quite the library they're gonna be juggling then i think it'll work but if they don't if they don't do this right like if they if they shove toddlers and tiaras in front of people who are showing up to watch a new episode of barry season four a very bleak and hilarious comedy everybody should watch uh 
it's not going to work. Like, I, I think it's, it's going to drive people away. They're going to laugh about it, joke about it. You get memes about it. Like, that diminishes your brand. HBO is quality. It's premium. It's a peak. I think they should stay there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, that's what I get excited for. And I, I just, I, I, I will give it a chance. Like, I'll see what is on Discovery Plus, see if there's any shows or anything I'd be interested in watching. But I, I don't anticipate that. You're not gonna go back and watch old episodes of MythBusters. You're not. You're not excited to go. <laughs> you're not excited to go watch Deadliest Catch. <laughs> God, I saw uh, all we'll those. Keep it... I saw those shows in the background in in the you know the double lots. Yeah, I like I just, like everyone else did. Like I said, like H. I think HBO is so cleverly managed to segue from a premium broadcast channel to a premium online streaming service. I think they do it better than anybody else. Meanwhile, like I cannot even be bothered to go look at the Discovery Plus website. Like it really is like this horrific, like Frankensteining of a brand I love into being something larger. And like, God, I hope it doesn't. God forbid it drag down anything HBO is doing because. It's great, but it's what they're all doing. It's it's what everybody over at, at Warner's doing now. This is their whole thing, right? Like it's it's their circus, it's their monkeys. Uh, we're all just paying admission for it. Uh, any other thoughts before our next review, Andy? I'm, I'm trying to keep us on time. I'm not doing a very good job, but I know we got to get going. I think I'm ready. Uh, well, Andy's gonna be taking the summary on this one. Fortunately, I'm excited to talk about this. Uh, this is something we we're looking forward to for a little while. I'm glad we finally watched it, Andy. Please take it away. Renfield. So this is the new uh, kind of horror action comedy starring Nicholas Holt and Nicholas Cage. Uh, Nicholas Cage famously playing Dracula in this movie, but the movie is not about him. It is about uh, Renfield, who is played by Nicholas Holt. Renfield is a character from Bram Stoker's Dracula, who's uh, he's Dracula's minion, his, his servant lackey, uh, played famously by Tom Waits in the 1992 adaptation of that. Here we. we we find him in modern Pittsburgh where uh, Renfield is kind of stuck in, in this relationship th that he doesn't like. He has to serve Dracula's needs, has to kill people, bring in bodies to eat. And he's kind of joined uh, this uh, support group for people in toxic relationships. And he's trying to get, get out of it, but he doesn't really know how to, he feels really trapped. And at the same time we meet uh, Aquafina's character, police officer rebecca quincy who's trying to take on organized crime in philadelphia which is a little it's a big subplot um she's trying to take down the lobo crime family at, at one point they cross paths during during a a big shootout and they kind of learn about each other's problems and help each other out uh this movie's a lot of fun uh it's big on the action of the action comedy and of course we get to see the great nicholas cage absolutely chewing scenery as dracula uh, which is what the main reason we're all there for uh so zach what do you think uh renfield is surprisingly fun for the size of it uh, it's a 65 million dollar feature from director chris mckay and i can't remember the last time i feel like we saw just like a bombastic mid-budget you know action comedy uh that's high concept um with some good talent on screen that's like surprisingly good like i i i <laughs> it's not gonna break any records it's not getting nominated for any academy awards or anything uh but renville's pretty fun like it's just a decent good time at the movies and like i feel like i can say that effectively because it never claimed to be anything bigger first off it's an r-rated action comedy right and they lean hard on the r rating i think the second line in the script features the f-bomb like it opens right opening scene people are dropping f-bombs right and it goes all throughout the whole feature big blood big gore big violence big acting from nick cage who i didn't know uh this is fun fact this is nicholas cage's first uh supporting actor role since 2013 when he played uh supporting actor in kick-ass um he's oh, been wow. main he, he's been lead every other time it's been a decade <laughs> my, my man will not get in the background but uh he's got an affinity for dracula also, Superman, more, more Nick Cage trivia. Uh, Nick Cage wanted to play Superman, Dracula, and Captain Nemo. 
from 20,000 Leagues Under mm -hmm. the Sea at some point in his life. And he was going to be Superman for Tim Burton, but now he's too old and says he won't do it. Uh, he's This is Dracula. Somebody get on that 20,000 Leagues remake. Nick Cage at the front. It's a good movie. Anyway, Renfield is fun, like, for what it is. Like, I was surprised at how much I enjoyed it. It's got some decent laughs with a pretty hot script coming from Chris McKay, uh, coming off the heels of Lego Batman. And um, I don't know, man. It's, it's, it's not a bad time. Right, let, let's talk about it. Yeah, it's a fun time. Real quick fun fact, Nick Nicholas Cage owns a copy of uh, Superman number 1, uh the famous like 1937 like the first appearance of Superman. Uh Nicholas Cage owns one of those that's worth like 2 million dollars. Um anyways, no, th this movie's a lot of fun and and it's one of those things like it has a ridiculous premise and a ridiculous trailer and it reminds me of last year's um the unbearable weight of massive talent, the other Nick Cage movie that was very meta where he played himself yeah, the movie ended up ended up being a very big disappointment, and didn't it, it didn't really deliver on, on its premise. And Renfield is kind of the opposite of that, where it it really does. It it is over the top. It is ridiculous, but it also has a lot of heart because you have this kind of more grounded plot uh, of him trying to. It's it's almost like a, a friend breakup. It's like it's him trying to get away from this really terrible situation he's in this bad relationship and he kind of gets manipulated and gaslit and all these things into still s serving dracula but we see him get some support he he moves out he gets an apartment he dresses like he, he shops at old old navy there were, there were a bunch of old navy gags they cut from the from, from the script surprising uh, amount of old navy gags yeah um but it, it's a lot of fun. There's a little bit too much going on plot-wise. Like I said, there's this whole subplot about uh, taking on this crime family, which I think is a little bit too too heavy. But it, it's just fun enough. Like There's so much action. And it looks like they're probably going to lose a lot of money in this movie, but they really put a lot of money in the action. Like There's so many action scenes, and there's like car chases uh, and things like that. And it's really over the top. And it was a fun time, even if it may not um, be financially successful. I think one of the things that's most surprising about this movie is like the practicality of a lot of the action and set pieces. Um, the production design in this movie is surprisingly good. Um, at first, yeah. it's not that noticeable. You're like, <laughs> they put Nick Cage and, and, and Nicholas Holt in uh, old footage from like old black and white Dracula serials. Um, they like place them in there and make it look like, you know, there's this Dracula of your Chris McKay actually said that he wanted this to be a direct sequel to basically dracula which is silly obviously but i think that draws inspiration uh, in the film makes for a couple of good gags and then you get like a flash forward to now right like uh, modern day new orleans i think is where they're at where you've got a gangster's hideout and this like big fancy mansion penthouse thing uh you've got like nick holt's uh nicholas holt's apartment which is like it looks like the inside of the cat in the hat's house like the mike myers movie <laughs> like every wall is faded like bright orange or green or teal you've got dracula's hideout which is in like this old abandoned hospital with this like really sick like blood bag throne thing they've got built uh which is really cool really like, impressive crumbling stuff all kinds of stuff. And I was impressed at how practical a lot of the stunts are. Like in the in the opening action sequence, Dracula is just pounding on some vampire honors. Uh, and one of them gets Dracula whips one. one hold on. Let me get my thoughts. One of them whips open the curtains at one point. Dracula bursts into flames and leaps at this guy and starts like pounding on him. Right. Like he sits on his chest and starts beating him up. And it's literally a stuntman in a fire suit beating on another stunt man like in fireproof clothes it's insane like i can't remember the last time i saw a literal man on fire in a movie well ant-man could never there's a scene when he uh possesses a priest and then explodes him and it's like a brilliant body explosion uh, uh, uh ben schwartz's character this kind of like <laughs> this kind of gangster crony who's perfect for uh he's got this big fancy dodge charger with this stupid decal on the side and one more he drives it like over a curb through like four trash cans and like past a light pole and it's like it's a literal car and I'm like, it's just nice to see that again because I feel like so many studios will just shoot on green screen and we'll do it in post. And like, it was actually really nice to see like just practical effects, people on wires in action sequences. Admittedly, the blood is is pretty 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 bad CGI. Like, I think they maybe gonna tighten that up because it, it looks pretty clunky in the movie, but it's fast and you don't really think about it, right? Like, and ultimately, it's supposed to be a comedy, and I think that stuff comes off as more tongue in cheek than inauthentic. Yeah, it, like I said, it it really 
the action stuff really works and it, there, there there was just a lot more of it than i thought i thought it would lean more into like the drama of it but there's tons of action there's also a ton of comedy like there are a ton of jokes and uh it, it work they work and they, they land and they land more often than they don't because there's nothing worse than going into a comedy and and where it's just crickets in the, in the theater um yeah but but it, it it's a good laugh uh kind of all the, all the way through um i want to talk about our our cast here because we, we have some other standouts from our leads we also have Ben Schwartz as I didn't realize this was the name, Tedward Lobo. <laughs> Tedward. <laughs> His name's um, Tedward. Oh, that's great. Yeah. Uh the great Shoray Agdashlu as uh the kind of matriarch of this crime fa- family, Bella Francesca Lobo. She was actually like um she was nominated for an Oscar for Best Actress um a while ago. So it's funny to, yeah, yeah, to yeah. see her to see her in this. And then uh just a lot of supporting characters but uh you know they play like the big bad mafia family uh really well and and that that's just a fun counter counterpoint um again it's a little it's heavier on the plot than it should be for uh i mean it's basically a 90 minute movie (laughs) um as well so it just it's kind of taken on a little bit too much to wrap up too tightly but it's just it's so much fun like there's laugh and when you're not laughing there there's action and there's a sweet uh, kind of uh, will they won't they romance between Nicholas Holt and uh, Aquafina's characters and it's just a lot of fun yeah it's funny that first trailer that came out for this made it like seem much smaller and I was really pleased that like there's a bit more going on in this movie than meets the eye like that first trailer makes it look like uh, Nicholas Holt rages out when a bunch of dudes storm a bar and and he kills a bunch of them and then Aquafina is like oh you, you that was crazy and the next morning they're in their apartment and they're wearing different clothes and you're like oh guys they're, they're getting together and then we got to go take on Dracula and that's the movie and like now now there's actually a bit bit more to it than that I, I was surprised at this through line of like genuine. Um, yeah, adult, adults with like codependency issues it seems silly but like these therapy sessions that like holt is going to to try to get his character renfield over this like dependency he has on dracula this monster all the other people at the at the meeting of course don't really know that he's talking to the talking about the prince of darkness they just assume he's talking about his boss who's a narcissist but like i was surprised at like how much i think actual like thought was going into the script behind that stuff there's a great sequence where he like confronts Nicholas Cage, who laughs it off, of course, because he's freaking Dracula. But he he's like, hey, like I'm a person, and like I have thoughts, and like I I mean something. And I was like, oh man, like they're son of a gun. There's just a little bit of heart behind behind this. <laughs> yeah, script. it, like, it that's gets actually, a little serious. It's actually really yeah. nice. Yeah, and meanwhile, like Cage is doing it so big, which is great. Uh, he did some interview somewhere where he said they shot a few scenes to this movie, and and Chris McKay was like, hey, could you? you know go bigger and he was like oh you want the full cage okay yeah and he brings the full cage which is a delight like if there's no better way to have cage as a supporting actor than him going just 110 percent, like in the right direction right and like they they managed to get him there perfect uh also ben schwartz like surprisingly funny and and ben schwartz is already funny i feel like the man doesn't get enough work as it is like great pick as kind of this cowardly gangster who's trying to be tough like cover him in tattoos he's got the high-pitched voice he sounds like sonic the hedgehog great if anybody like i think nicholas holt was the most tamped down only because yeah. he's supposed to be this guy who's like really struggling and like you know is is really has no self-confidence and can't talk to anybody about his problems like so that was actually kind of nice, I think, in, in in his own way. I I didn't mind his his portrayal of Renfield. Yeah, I he, you're right. He he is kind of the most uh, kind of watered down character, but at the same time, he and we left this out. Uh, he kind of has these superpowers he gets from eating bugs. Uh, so you'll see me eat him, but and that's kind of the the first big action sequence. He he fights a bunch of gangsters that they're about to shoot Aquafina's character. Um, he eats a bug and he you know has super strength and he can like throw people across the room and there's tons of gore with it uh, too. So even though his character is a little bit tamped down, he gets to do a lot of the the real fun stuff. Yeah, um, I think overall like Renfield is charming because it's so simple. But it feels so tangible. Like I, I, they, they just shot a lot of things practical. Like they just built the sets. They got the costumes. Nick Cage has these like horrifically uncomfortable looking sharp teeth in his mouth the whole movie. Like big yeah, smiles. If you're watching yeah. us on Facebook Live, I got it up on screen right now. Like yeah, 
like I, I think that stuff just helps it feel like a bit more real and like if it's gonna be a comedy which it is and it does the comedy pretty well uh, and it's gonna be an r-rated feature like i think it's important you give your audience that subtext the whole reason snakes on a plane work isn't because samuel jackson looks at the camera and says this is ridiculous right snakes on a plane it's because they play it straight and they they respect their audience enough to be able to read that and see that of course it's ridiculous it's snakes on a plane um and Renfield, I think, kind of approaches it from the same angle. Like, everybody, every adult watching this movie knows that it's not some big blockbuster joint. Like, it's not some huge studio putting it out. Like, it's just a fun little script starring Nicolas Cage and, and Nicholas Holt for 90 minutes being, being vampire people. I'm like, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of rad. I, yeah, I, I, I don't, I, I can't fault it. Yeah, exactly. I, I thought it was, a, it was a real fun time. Uh, laugh through through most of it. More jokes land than than don't, and yeah, it's just it's a fun time at the movies. Yeah, it sure is. Andy, would you recommend Renfield? I would. Like I said, it's a lot of fun. It's short. It's only ninety minutes. Uh, good. You get to see Nick Cage really chewing screen. It's funny because you you can see him like actually lose character and just turn into full full blast nick cage is for part of it um there's a lot, a lot of jokes uh aquafina is funny uh, as well good action um if you're a little un unsure I, I would say you, save it for streaming if you're if you're not a huge fan of this but yeah i saw nick cage in, in the makeup and i was like i gotta see that <laughs> yeah how could you not yeah i don't know what streaming service it'll be coming to it'll be there soon though or vod because like Andy said unfortunately it's not doing that stellar at the box office it is a bit of a reflection on like what people are willing to spend money on right if you're going to go to the theater and blow 50 bucks on tickets and popcorn you want it to be something that's like big and bold and like a quick 90 minute romp may not be that thing but for people who go see movies a lot especially like andy and i you could do worse man like Ren renfield ain't bad I, I have a hard time faulting this movie this would be a good the drama the drama bits are a little slow in the second act but like it feels like something you could put on like a halloween party on mute right yeah. like you people will kind of watch it but it's never going to draw too much attention like it's a solid little feature like I, th I think renfield's pretty fun um you could certainly do worse and that's renfield uh well, now we do need to talk about one more movie on this podcast uh a movie that we didn't it's not that we didn't formally want to cover this. I think Andy and I didn't know that we were both going to go see it. And it kind of worked out that we both yeah. had an interest in this. Um, so now we want to talk about it. Andy, do you want to take the summary or should I? I think I can. I got one cocked and ready to go. But if not, go ahead. Go like, ahead. You, you seem ready. All right. Perfect. Uh, the movie is, uh, say, this is our micro review of Suzume. Or Suzume. Uh, so <laughs> Suzume is uh, from director uh, Makoto Shinkai, uh, who is a acclaimed animation director hailing from Japan. Uh, you may know him from his very popular film, Your Name, which came out just a few years ago, uh, snubbed at the Oscars, in my humble opinion. Uh, he also most recently did Weathering With You. And before all of that, he did a film called Five Centimeters Per Second, which got a lot of attention, uh, at least in... Uh, Japanese animation circles. Anime, as it's commonly known, uh, is usually hand animated, but I think Shinkai's studio works well because they blend hand-drawn animation with just enough CGI to look hand-drawn to kind of get across like the gap of a full feature while also being on budget. And fortunately, Shinkai's writing is what makes these movies so effective. He often tells stories of young people who are struggling to overcome something much larger than themselves, right? Whether that be an anxiety from inside or an external force that they have to physically fight, usually both. And Suzume isn't much different. I think it's worth mentioning before we jump into it, I don't want to tell you to tune out, but Andy and I knew absolutely nothing about this movie going in. I hadn't even watched a trailer. And in a lot of ways, I think that may be the best way to see it. So micro review here is most appropriate. Suzume is the story of Suzume. That's her name, right? A young high school girl who lives on the far south side of Japan, goes to a small school, lives with her aunt, and ultimately things are pretty normal until one day she meets a stranger on the side of the road on the way to school uh, who asks her if she knows any ruins in the area. Weird question, but okay. She says, yeah, there's, a, uh, there's an old village that got bombed out a few years ago. You can go check that out. She gets to school and thinks to herself, you know what? Actually, I, I want to know what that guy was about. She had a weird feeling when she saw him. So she hops on her bike, rides back, and there she discovers a door right just right in the middle of this kind of like 
school stadium thing. Uh, and so when she opens it, she discovers that not all is as it seems in the world. In a bit of an Alice through the looking glass situation, things are very different on the other side of this otherworldly portal. Uh, and this stranger has an awful lot to do with that. Uh, and before she knows it, Suzume is thrust on an adventure, not only to undo this, uh, this, this, this problem that she inadvertently caused, uh, but to save all of Japan. It's a surprisingly long romp. It's about two hours. Uh, the film covers, um, well, before I get into it, Andy, what did you think of Suzume? Uh, I, the, initially, I wasn't really into it because it has a very kind of uh, stereotypical anime setup. You, you have a young girl. She's interested in this guy. There's this fantastic setting. It's like how every anime starts. Um but it really goes to some interesting places. Uh, it it it's surprisingly heavy because it's it's about grief and loss and uh, kind of working through those things very heavily. But it's also um, it's also about Japan's fear of nuclear annihilation, which is a constant theme in in Japanese work. Uh, famously, uh, uh, Akira is exactly that and you get some of that this because you know they have these portals that they open and the reason they have to close them is because there will be these massive earthquakes but it, it's kind of representative of like the dropping of, of the atomic bomb and I, I was like this is a kids movie like this is this is like for yeah. teenagers and it's got some really heavy stuff um but it, it's it handles it in a really mature way and there's great visuals and uh, it's also funny. There's a lot of good humor. It's also very modern. Like there's lots of like cell phones and social media kind of stuff aspects to the movie as well. I was really, really surprised and I really enjoyed it. Yeah. I think one of the things Shinkai does really well is his settings and the previous two features that I've seen your name and weathering with you once saw both in theaters, uh, both of them are number one uh, god I, I gotta get this out of the way beautifully animated good god like this is some of the most beautiful animation you could see on a screen it is criminal these films are not nominated for animate for best animated every year i've heard some people say well it's a foreign language film and and there are some issues with where that comes from and who gets into that okay sure fine but it's worth mentioning uh, before this movie not only did it have a full trailer package 22 minutes long disney and dreamworks both advertised on on it all right. These studios know that this film's got heat. All right. Makoto Shinkai is turning out good work. I hope he gets a bit more respect on the name. Uh, the animations movie stellar. And both of those movies, Your Name and Weathering With You, started with fundamentally small settings. Both have a bit of a small town and a bit of a city feel. Uh, I think both are in Tokyo or nearby. I'm, I'm not even really sure. But this movie uniquely travels nearly the breadth of Japan. Uh, Suzume's journey literally takes her from one side to the other of the island. She will be on planes. She isn't actually going to have a plane. Trains and automobiles for sure, though, and boats, buses, a bicycle, a couple of bicycles, actually a motorbike. She takes a journey like from one place to another, from her small town to a bigger town to a big city to the farmlands, like out to the middle of nowhere, and then turns around and goes all the way back which is crazy but it makes it feel like this big grand epic thing right and i think one of the things i really like about shinkai's work is i never know where exactly it's going i can never put the pieces together before he gets there and in a way you don't want to like i think one of the most charming things about a great feature is that you can sit back and kind of turn your brain off and just let it come to you right let me figure out where these themes are going as they happen let me try to figure out like what's coming next admittedly I, I i will say i did find myself a bit more confused by this one like andy said at least in the open because it all feels very plain and i think that's part of the point right yeah. suzume is supposed to be portrayed as a bit of a plain girl but before you know it like it ends up going somewhere that i didn't predict and i think that's what he does so well um a stellar presentation wrapped in like mystery uh and, and i agree like the subtext of this movie is fantastic like i'm a big akita fan and um yeah, Andy's Andy's mention of functionally like the fear of of, of annihilation is really fascinating because it's wrapped in this story of like a young girl who's using her iPhone to cross Japan. Yeah, like I said, it, it's very it has very tropey, stereotypical setup, and but it does that thing that any great movie does, which is it it tells you a story, but it, it's about 
much deeper things than what the surface story. Because, like, again, it's this fantastical story. You got to close these doors or else this big, you know, destructive monster will will get out. And, you know, it's it's a, it's a fantasy film, but it's a, it's about very real concrete things. Yeah, uh, I really like the blend of like old, old, old feel, I should say, with modern technology. And he mentioned it uh, in his opening bit, but um, there are phones everywhere in this movie, even in places where it feels like there shouldn't be right. Like small town Japan, where they're like farmlands, nothing's happening. Like Suzume will we'll get her phone out to like check a text or something. And her aunt is texting her the whole movie. <laughs> She's actually on missing <laughs> and completely Where blown it off. And, and, and the aunt, the, yeah, the aunt <laughs> thinks she's with a guy and she's like, you better not be with a boy. Oh my God. Um, but I, I liked how modern like that makes the trappings of this feel. It feels like kind of a timeless story, like wrapped in a setting that's accessible. I, I, there's a scene when uh, she's staying with a friend that just, just outside of her hometown uh, and they're, they're sleeping on, these like rolled out pads on the ground futons and they have their phones like dangling across like cables from the wall, like to get to the floor, like just like any kid would like plug in their phone for an alarm clock before they go to sleep. Um, the brands in this movie are all on right. McDonald's, Spotify, Kubota, Toyota, like uh, Acura. Like you just see like actual brands, like real brands the in, in the movie, like it's nothing like and in Renfield, you see an old Navy bag, and you're like, you roll your eyes like, okay, yeah, it's an old Navy placement. And this movie, like, it's just part of the world. Like, it doesn't feel like these are ad placements. These just feel like, you know, a reflection of the world we live in. I think that stuff, like, helps people step through the screen, helps them feel like, oh, this is a modern tale in a modern setting that I understand and know, and that these are, like, more accessible characters. And that helps, like, the emotion hit deeper, because just like any of his features, like, this movie does ultimately have an emotional message that personally rang just a, just a hair hollow but uh there were definitely some people get getting 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 a little little teary-eyed in our theater so i may just be me yeah i i definitely got caught up in in the emotion uh for sure and they're just some of the just per, per, portrayals of loss and grief were just very uh, accurate i i think um but like i said just surprised at the maturity uh of the film and it, it is, and again yeah. just because something is for younger audiences doesn't mean it has to be dra trash or, <laughs> or for babies right like something pixar was praised as doing in their early work was making films and they still do this on occasion but making movies that look like they're for kids but really are for the adults like deep down you didn't know it but like inside out is not made for 13 year olds like it's made for the parent who's sitting there going oh my god up is not made for like eight year olds like that's that's made for people who are a little older you know like and you wouldn't know it looking at it but like it's only when you start to look deeper that you see oh okay like there's something really resounding here. And I think Suzume does that pretty well. Like I, I liked it more than weathering with you. I don't think I liked it more than your dude. Your name is so good. Oh my God. Yeah. I can't believe that movie didn't genuinely get best, best animated that, that year. <laughs> like criminal. Oh my God. Um, and this movie's doing great at the box office too. Like a lot of people are seeing it. Like it's getting a lot of attention for what it is. Like I know it's not getting like Jaimungo gi gi release or anything, but it's popular and the circles it needs to be in. Um, I don't think it's in a bad place. Yeah, it, it's uh, this was a big hit in Japan in the fall, um, and also it's been released in China and it's been successful there. So I'm glad we're it's getting around to us as well. Yeah, me too. We'll definitely have to check out Shinkai's next work, whatever that is. Um, for now, yeah. we should wrap up our little micro review. I, I meant for it to be a micro review, and here I am <laughs> uh, going on full review. It's fine. Andy, uh, would you recommend Suzume? Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. Uh, it's a fantastic coming of age story uh, that there's fantasy elements. It has a very kind of familiar setup, uh, but then it goes into a lot of really unexpected places, both narratively and visually as, as well. Really exciting uh, kind of climaxes that that we reach. Um, a lot of fun. Yeah, same. I think Suzume is a ton of fun. I'm really glad we watched it. Uh, I Like I said, I'll probably go see whatever his next feature is without question. Um, I don't know, man. I think Zoom is a good time. Go check it out if you're interested. If you're into if you're into foreign animation, uh, if you're an anime fan, like I think Zoom is a good time. We don't watch a lot of anime on this show, so uh, it's cool. Like when we get the opportunity to see something that feels theatrical, wraps itself up, right? Like it's not it's not a 
130 episode series you're not watching one piece like you just <laughs> yeah. got a tight two hour boom start to finish story um easy e- easy to grab right F- finger food for movies but like really good finger food anyway uh with that we should wrap the show uh, andy what are we watching next week it's gonna be a big week in horror we have evil dead rise the uh kind of reboot something or other of the evil dead fran- franchise um that lo- that it looks like it's gonna be really gory that comes out this friday in theaters and then we also have aria Astor's follow up his third film after um mid somar uh Bo is afraid starring joaquin phoenix which we really don't know much about this it's supposed to be a horror movie but the trailer's kind of crazy can't really tell what's going on it's also three hours long uh the man's not tour and like i i don't know what i'm getting into but i'm kind of excited for it it reminds me a little of when like damien chazelle made first man like after the success of of whiplash and la la land paramount was like we will write you a blank check you can make whatever you want and he made first man because it was something that, that he really wanted to make and it was thoughtful and uh it didn't do the greatest but like i think he he, he earned that spot and i think bow and bow's afraid is in that same place um astro said in interviews he's like i can't believe a24 funded this <laughs> but <laughs> you, i mean you made hereditary oh, mid- midsummer like scorsese just just earlier today i saw a screening last night scorsese called aster uh, one of the most exciting like up-and-coming auteurs in world cinema like he's he's a big deal excited to watch it and from what i hear that evil dead rise movie is hot all every review i've seen so far has been like dude evil dead rise is a good time i like 2016 evil dead like i thought that was a good time so i'm excited next week double horror feature if you want to hear it there's an easy way to do that you can just uh you know subscribe to the show there's subscribe to off script on your favorite podcast platform itunes google play spotify iron media we're in all the usual places uh we're also on facebook where we live stream the show every tuesday at five uh we're on twitter we're on instagram you can follow us over there you can comment for correspondence let us know what you thought of the show and if you get the chance Give us five stars on your favorite podcast platform. You have no idea how much that five-star rating helps us, puts us in front of other people, helps grow the show, helps get out to more folks. You know, it's a, it's a bit of a thank you for your boys off script going to see movies. Movies are expensive. Podcasts are cheap. So thanks for uh, thanks for listening. And uh, I don't know. Go, oh, you can you can write us correspondence formally at mail at offscriptmovie.com. And you can check – running out of gas here. Check out our website <laughs> Mm-hmm. Uh, for more interviews clips uh, and more from the show oh and our youtube page is we do we got hot things going on, on youtube listen re- real talk i know i say all those things at the end of every episode youtube is great though you should go check us out on youtube real re- real things happening over there and of course subscribe to, the, to off script wherever you get your podcasts i think it's the third time i said that i gotta wrap this up from all of us at off script the home of bold cinema i'm zach lewis and i'm dr draper <laughs>